first thing I wanted to say is that you guys are so cool. I'm just really, really thrilled to be here. And I think this is a, a, a wonderful event and really excited to hear about the launch of the Alliance. Um, so I'm just going to be talking briefly about why, why does maintenance matter for social justice? Why is this an issue f of social justice? My name is Becky Faith. I've been working, um, as Janet indicated, I'm a, I'm a, a long-standing geek. I've been working in the field of technology and social justice, both in international NGOs and in my own backyard in Brighton for longer than I care to remember. I did a PhD at the Open University in the Department of Computing, looking at how young uh, socially excluded women use mobile phones and the role of mobile phones in their life. And now I help lead the digital and technology research group. Here I am with my team at the Institute of <laughs> Development Studies at the University of Sussex. And for those of you who don't know IDS, we work on three defining challenges, which I think link very strongly to the, to the work of the Restart Project and Restarters Worldwide. Reducing inequalities, ac accelerating sustainability, and building inclusive and secure societies. So we work on issues from conflict to agriculture, but we also work on um, issues like the circular economy. We had a big conference on the circular economy, so that's looking at how, for example, kind of waste pickers in the developing world, how they have livelihoods which contribute to um, sustainability. For me, digital inequality is one of the kind of key axes of inequality that we face now globally. So your access to technology and your access to kind of meaningful use of technology really defines how well you do in society. So with poor connectivity, everything's more expensive. In the UK, you'd know that like, if you're not able to search for a better um, electricity deal online, you're going to be worse off. Um, you're going to lack political voice. Your access to services is going to be really comprom compromised. So I think it's really important to think about digital equality as an axis of inequality now. Um, and for marginalised communities, for example, homeless people, if you're kind of if you you have limited literacy, um, affected by poverty, then your kind of connectivity is going to be unstable. And I'm going to talk a bit about my PhD research, which which kind of revealed some of the instability of these connections. So my PhD research, which I did about three years ago, and I did it in in Brighton with. Um, uh, with young unemployed women in Brighton asked, how does socially excluded young women's use of mobile devices, it's an academic piece of research, impact on their capabilities? <laughs> Which basically said, what difference does it make if you're young, unemployed, and you're homeless? What difference does it make to have a mobile phone in your life? And the most of them had smartphones, actually. So I talked to homeless and unemployed women uh, in Brighton about the impact of mobile phone use on their life. So the positive things, it's a really important means of connection, if you're um, insecurely housed, as, as most of them were, um, it's a way of staying connected with family, with um, kind of social support, service information, like how to get like um, on housing waiting lists, benefit information, fun, Instagram, the usual stuff. But many, many negatives. They were incredibly expensive. So these, uh, these girls were being... We had like 19-year-old, unemployed, pregnant, homeless women being offered £40 a month iPhone contracts by unscrupulous mobile phone companies. Um, the credit rating limit on mobile phone contracts is really low, so it's really, really easy to get a phone contract. Then you lose the phone and you're stuck with this £40 a month phone contract. And that can, for some of them, it was up to 15% of their income. And the women were feeling really addicted to these devices. And the tyranny of maintenance. Who knew? They're really... Mobile phones. We saw how lowly ranked Samsung was. A lot of these girls had um, galaxies or whatever. They're really expensive to maintain. The battery life is rubbish. And they're really hard to use. So they're often really challenging, especially if your kind of educational status isn't great. So I'm just going to give you some quotes from, my, uh, from some of the interviews to, so, to give you an idea of the kind of challenges that these young women faced and how they're to do with maintenance. So this is uh, so a lot of them were of an age where they'd grown up with mobile phones, but they'd started off with Nokias. And I asked this girl, what was the first phone you had? Oh, Nokias, they seem to last me well. This phone's got a screen crack. That, that would never happen with the old Nokias. They seem to be indestructible. 
And after, at the end of my PhD uh, field work, my, the screen cracked on my Nexus, and I went out three years ago and bought this beauty. <laughs> you can, like, throw this down the toilet. <laughs> I haven't. But it, you can just chuck it around. They're brilliant, the old Nokias. But these, a lot of them talked about the fact that, these new, that smartphones were very, very vulnerable, really vulnerable to, um, to breakage, which they are. Another girl asked her, so what would you do to get it mended? She was complaining. A lot of them had cracks in their phones or things weren't working. Or this, she, she was just confused by it and frustrated by the fact she couldn't turn it off. So this girl said, I think I'd have to pay a lot to get it mended. But at the moment, I don't exactly need it because it locks automatically. It's only a lock button. And she wouldn't know how to turn her phone off completely. So you have technology. It gives you, like, in, in the kind of grand visions of lots of the kind of Silicon Valley people, like, technology can open up the whole world for you. You might be homeless and living on benefits or, or living in a slum somewhere, but it doesn't matter because you've got this mobile phone in your hand. But actually, it's incredibly disempowering and it's expensive. So I would ask the girls, what do they hate about their phone? A lot of them said battery life, battery life, battery life, battery life. Always kept coming up and the fact they broke really easily. This girl said, oh, I hate that everyone relies on their phone and you have to charge them and they're so temperamental. I dropped it this morning and now it's not working. And so what will you do in situations like that? Well, leave it, maybe get it fixed. Do you find it expensive to get it fixed? Yeah, I find it's phones expensive generally. Phones are ridiculous. They always need charging. So again, these are girls who are really reliant on. If you, I mean, some uh, some of them were literally like living in tents because they had nowhere to live in Brighton. It's like London, really expensive housing costs. So they need having good battery life and, and being able to charge your phone is really really important. So another girl, she was using a phone to try and find housing on Gumtree, but she didn't really know how to use it. What do you find difficult about it? Oh, they change the software all the time, so things all look different, or they move, and I don't know where they've gone, or it freezes. So what do you do when it freezes? I leave it. I think I better not touch it. This is, this is a kind of conversation you might have with, I had with these um, unemployed women, but you might well have it with my mother-in-law or with people who you know in your life who haven't got such great technical skills. And that's most people, actually. That's my husband, God bless him. He doesn't got great technical skills. Lots of people are, feel very disempowered by this technology that they have to use in their life. They leave it, it freezes, and they think, oh, I better not touch it. They're scared of it. They feel disempowered. And I think, actually, that's what's great about, the, about fixing stuff. It makes you feel empowered in relation to technology. So for these young women and other marginalised communities, take these young women. This was 30 young women in Brighton. Let's replicate these women to the communities you work in around the world. These inequalities they experience, so their, their lack of housing, their poor education, the zero-hours contracts they're working in, were exacerbated by these maintenance challenges. They were exacerbated by the fact that their phone would run out of charge and they had nowhere to plug them in because they had insecure housing. So as more people get online, these digital inequalities aren't so much about the fact of whether you've got a phone or not, whether you've got access to a computer. It's about your ability to maintain that access to technology. And this is where you guys come in. Over to you. <laughs> my name's Lewis Dartnell. Um, as you already heard, my... Actual research field, I'm a research scientist uh, at the University of Westminster, just up the road uh, in North London, where I hold a professorship in science communication. And my research is all about looking uh, into the possibility of life beyond the Earth. What, what signs of life, what biosignatures might we be able to detect on the surface of Mars with our uh, rovers, our robotic probes that we're building at the moment? Uh, I come from a biology background. And we're looking into how life might be able to survive in other environments, on other planets, moons, and our solar system, and how we discover them. So that, that's my day job, helping in the hunt for aliens, if you like. <laughs> and alongside that, I do a whole lot of science communication and media work uh, and writing books. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning was on something completely and utterly different from, from the astrobiology. And I want to play through a, a thought experiment with you. So let's just imagine that this has actually happened. There's been some kind of global catastrophe, a doomsday event, uh, an apocalypse. 
And civilization has collapsed, and the vast majority of humanity has perished. So it's this kind of sci-fi trope. It's the walking dead. It's the last of us. It's all these films, computer games, and books we're quite familiar with. Let's imagine it's actually happened. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, that this lecture theatre at the London School of Economics, we're all sat in right now, has served as some kind of hardened bunker. And we have survived the end of the world when most other people have perished. Hey! <laughs> and we go outside, blinking in the bright October sunlight uh, in about an hour or two's time, and find the devastation of our civilization around us, the, the smoking ruins of London. And so the question now is, well, what next? What would you most need to know? What would be the most useful knowledge to have saved in your head to survive the immediate aftermath? And I don't just mean kind of bare grill skills of how do I find water? Can I skin a badger with my teeth? But in the longer term, how could you go about rebuilding everything from scratch? Could you reboot civilization in the way you'd reboot a computer if it crashed? How could you avoid another dark ages? How could you ensure that vital knowledge wasn't lost to history again and then accelerate the recovery process? Could you navigate some kind of shortcut route through this vast network of scientific understanding and technological innovations, of inventions that have enabled us to build this modern world that we all live in? Could you shortcut that rebooting process. So in short, what would be the single manual that you would want handed to you that tells you all of the most useful stuff from history, about how things are made, how things are done, the stuff you would hope would never get lost again so you could recover and reboot everything from scratch? So essentially what I'm talking about is could you do this for real? Could you do Minecraft for real? Could you start in a blank, empty landscape and nowhere to go to gather the resources from the natural environment around us and, and make tools and combine things in different ways to make all the stuff that we've just come to rely upon in our modern day lives. As a, as a civilization, we're incredibly capable and sophisticated and advanced, but on an individual level, we're incredibly incompetent and unempowered. And that's been the theme from all of the talks and all the discussion we've been hearing at FixFest. People are no longer connected with the means of production. We don't know how to make things or do things or understand on even a basic level where stuff comes from. It just appears in the shops as if by magic. So to explore that idea, to hold up a mirror to our modern world, to kind of peer under the bonnet of the engine of how our world works, I tried to write that book, that manual, that tongue-in-cheek is a thought experiment you could use to reboot civilization after an apocalypse. Uh, we, we've heard already it's called the knowledge, how to rebuild our world from scratch. But in essence, there's nothing original about this idea. Right back to the very early days of the mid-1700s, when the very first encyclopedias were being written, for example, by Denis Diderot, in the prefaces of these encyclopedias, on, on these tomes, for the very first time, trying to collect together and collate the sum total of human knowledge, to, to write the total book, the book of all that is known. In the prefaces for these encyclopedias, they wrote about their motivation being to store stuff, to preserve it, to preserve that knowledge in case there's some kind of cataclysm were to hit the Western world as it did with ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and, and could happen again to our civilization. Uh, James Lovelock in 1998, again, kind of rephrased this idea of the book of all seasons, about how we should preserve stuff in a reliable format, so it never gets lost again, so we don't have to go through that hard process of rediscovering everything from the ground up. And I'm sure you're all aware of Marcin Jakubowski's project of the Global Village Construction Set, this idea of a collection, an assemblage of 50 bits of machinery that not only are competent to make all the things you need to run a society or to, to run a village in sub-Saharan Africa, but crucially, an interlinked network where the machines can repair or indeed build each other from scratch. So in a sense, this is a seed, a mechanical seed, for restarting a society from the ground up. And what I've been trying to do with the knowledge book is the knowledge, the information that we need alongside that technology to restart everything. Um, so what I did for the project, which took about two years from beginning to end, 
is look at all the different areas of capability of our modern world that we all rely upon without appreciating, without understanding. Everything from where food comes from and how we don't starve to death, to very basic chemistry and substances we rely upon. Uh, different materials like medicine, the element, uh, like different materials like metals, the elements of medicine, how you make power and electricity, how we transport things around, uh, all the way up to time and place. How can you reinvent a calendar from scratch by using astronomy? How can you navigate yourself around the world and all the different uh, sets of information and inventions and technologies embedded in all those different areas? These, these are blatantly the chapters of the book, by the way, <laughs> the different themes. Uh, what I wanted to do, just very briefly for this 20 minutes, is pick out two examples that I think very well, work very well to illustrate the idea of, of how incapable we all are individuals now and try to address that. Every time I do a talk at a school or a, or a science festival, these two particular examples, I think, work particularly well to get people to, to address the idea in their minds, to, to realise how little we're able to do and maybe start trying to make amends in their own lives working out how to repair something, or thinking the supply chain where their product has come from and how you might be able to make that more sustainable or more efficient. And if you look within transport, within this thought experiment, within this premise, what you would really hope would not happen after some kind of apocalypse is your surviving society were to regress all the way to a state like this, where you've lost engines, you've lost machinery, you've lost mechanization. You can no longer flip a switch or turn a key and have a machine do something for you. You have to go back to using the back-breaking labor of your own muscles, as we did hundreds of years ago, or of draft animals or beasts of burden, hitching up a horse like this incredibly smug guy here has done, where he's chopped off the useless front half of the car, which doesn't work anymore, and made some kind of Mad Max chariot out of the back of his Datsun car here. So the question is, in this thought experiment, how can you keep machinery and engines running when you no, no longer have access to crude oil? You don't have access to petrol or diesel, as you wouldn't if we ever did have to restart civilization. We've already sucked up all of the easily suck upable crude oil. We'd have to reboot without that energy resource that got us through the late stages of the Industrial Revolution in our own history. And to illustrate how you can run a car without using diesel or petrol, I've got a short demonstration of something called a gasifier stove, which you may or may not have come across before. They're very, very easy to construct out of just, just garbage, stuff you have lying around at home, very simple tools, it takes about an hour of your time. And all you need is some empty tin cans. And you have a large outer tin can, and you sit a smaller tin can in the middle, drill or punch a load of holes at the bottom of both, put your wood in the middle of the inner tin can, and light it. And because you've got air holes at the bottom, it draws through a nice current of air of oxygen to get a vigorous combustion, just like any barbecue or any fire grate. But what is unique about this gasifier stove design is that it has a second row of holes right at the top. So after you've heated the wood with the, the heat of its own fire and released lots of vapors and gases and smoke, which is itself combustible, you then reintroduce oxygen into that mixture of gases and burn all of that as well. It's an incredibly efficient way of unlocking the energy locked up in the wood. Now, I don't get to demonstrate this live on stage anymore. Uh, I, was, I was asked out to do a main stage TED talk in Vancouver uh, last year, and I was sat in the makeup room, sat next to Monica Lewinsky, feeling incredibly nervous. Wanting to be nice, wanting to make chat with this other person sat next to me who's also very nervous. And the only thing I knew about Monica Lewinsky was the single thing you should never bring up <laughs> in polite conversation. So I sat there in silence, went out onto the big red spot of doom on the TED stage and demonstrated this gasifier stove and came about that close to setting fire to my own face, to my own head. I'd forgotten just how much hairspray they put into my hair uh, before shoving me out onto the stage. And this thing kicks out an enormous, enormous column of flame. Uh, so instead, I've got a short video to show how this works. So what you do with the gasifier stove, if you watch, I'm just putting a tiny, tiny amount of, uh, of wood, just a, a small handful of twigs. You don't need to load much fuel into this thing to get it to work incredibly efficiently, uh, efficiently and pump out 
a huge flame. You can see in the video here as well, more clearly, that large outer can with the air holes at the bottom, the inner cans hidden from view. Uh, I'm about to light it with a lighter. There's another video we produced for this book where I show how you can start fires using combinations of everyday objects. How you can start a fire ironically using a fire alarm, for example, but by exploiting understanding of physics and science and how things work. So it smokes a little bit at first, and then bang, within four or five seconds, the smoke has disappeared, because we're now combusting that as well, and it's been replaced by a four-foot jet of flame coming out the, the bottom of this tin can stove. In a second, you'll see where I almost lost my face. Then, <laughs> do not do that with hairspray in your hair over four-foot jets of flame. Uh, these gasifier stoves are also called uh, rocket stoves, perhaps for, for obvious reasons. And what the camera angle is about to do in a second is zoom in to that upper row of air holes. And you can see these jets of flame coming in from the top. The, the, the wood itself isn't burning. There's a clear gap with no flame above the wood as it turns to charcoal. And essentially, you're operating a gas hob. You have rings of, of, of fire where the gas and the oxygen are remixing and producing that incredible flame. Now, the reason I bring this up as an example is it's ludicrously simple to make yourself. This is the kind of stuff, there's uh, instructions up on the book's website, but I can do that with your brothers or sisters or your, your kids as a Saturday maker project before going on a camping trip or having some friends around for a barbecue. This is exactly the same, the right kind of appropriate technology or intermediate technology that is being taught around the developing world, around Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, so families can make the most efficient use of the firewood they can collect in a day but also because this thing is utterly smokeless when it's in operation, it's much, much healthier to cook with if you're in closed, cramped conditions in a, in a, in a shanty town or in a mud hut because you're not breathing that smoke in. And what you can also do is scale up your gasifier stove from something the size of an old baked beans can, scale up to something the size of a dustbin, strap it to the back of a car, <laughs> and you can run a car using wood as fuel rather than diesel or petrol. This is our gasifier stove on the back. That's where the wood is breaking down. It's pyrolyzing in the heat of its own combustion, giving off those producer gases, which you pipe over the roof of the car, down into the bonnet, inject into the engine cylinders, and only then allow to mix with oxygen to explode usefully to drive this car forward. Now, I will admit to you, this does look like some kind of crackpot, steampunk, Mad Max contraption. But they work perfectly well. And in fact, during the Second World War, with all the fuel shortages, because both sides got very good at blowing up each other's oil refineries, there are over a million gasifier-powered cars, a million wood-powered cars driving the roads of Europe to keep society going in this sort of localised apocalypse of, of all-out total war. And so again, within the premise of this thought experiment of how we could reboot after an apocalypse, this is exactly the kind of slightly simpler technology you could fall back to, stop any further aggression, stop your society sliding any further, and start pulling yourself back up by your own bootstraps. It's also a very neat demonstration of gasifier technology that's used very uh, widely across Scandinavia to generate electricity for the national power grid. Uh, in combined heat and power stations, they use it to heat uh, water for people's house heating and, and, and showers using exactly this technology, using that gasifier technology. It's, it's not just an apocalyptic fantasy. And the second example I wanted to briefly talk about was if you do take this possibility seriously, that our modern civilization could collapse, that we could have some kind of apocalypse, maybe Trump reaches for the wrong red button on his desk, doesn't push the I want coke now button, pushes the all out nuclear war button, and everything collapses, if, if we had some warning of this coming, maybe we saw an asteroid heading towards the Earth and we had six months to prepare, you might want to try to create some kind of hardened seed or kernel of all that we've built and understood and learnt today and build a, a, a total library. Clearly the premise behind, behind my book, behind the knowledge, is impossible. You could never put all the practical uh, information you'd ever want in a single paperback book. But you could potentially cram it into a, a library, like this incredible photo of a library, uh, which is the Cincinnati uh, Library. The problem with that is that wood's actually a fairly rubbish storage medium of information. Paper burns very well. 
And if the roofs start falling in on these libraries, uh, and water and rain gets in, then your paper starts turning to mulch and rotting. And you could perhaps never build enough libraries with all the information you need and have enough of them around the world that, that groups of survivors would be able to get to to make any pragmatic use of that information. But with modern technology, you can do far better than this. We don't need to save information in paper anymore. You can have a Kindle or other e-reader load onto it, into the memory of that device, 10,000 books, the most useful books about how to do things, how to make things, how to repair things, how things are done, and hold that entire library of human knowledge in the palm of your hand. The problem with that, of course, is if the apocalypse ever actually does come, you can't just plug your Kindle into the wall to recharge it. So this is all about thinking through the dependencies that we rely upon without considering in our everyday lives. So to address that, for the sake of having another fun maker project, I hacked a Kindle to make it apocalypse proof. Uh, ruggedized the case slightly, uh, embedded it in this uh, kind of fold out case, and then put some scavenged solar panels, second hand solar panels, which I wired all together with tabbing wire, did a lot of soldering, connected it into uh, the recharging USB port of the Kindle, loaded onto it a copy of, of the knowledge and 9,999 other useful books. And the idea is now you could have all that information in the palm of your hand, ready to go, ready to access. And if the, if the apocalypse ever does come and the grid goes down, you just simply leave it out in the sunshine to recharge that information, to, to keep it accessible uh, and you're able to get at it. And again, it's that kind of, of technology which would be incredibly useful in the developing nations or in uh, recovery areas or in disaster zones. Giving people access to the information they need, for, for, for example, how to purify water so you don't start getting waterborne diseases like cholera or typhoid after an earthquake or after a hurricane, is this kind of technology that could do that. Like I say, I'm, I'm using the apocalypse as a, as a thought experiment, but this is about our real world and about how we can start educating people to think a little more deeply about how things are done and where they come from. Very briefly, there's a website. Um, if any of this has been of any interest, you can explore the Knowledge's website. Uh, one example is how I argue that Miley Cyrus is the most important scientific experiment in human history. <laughs> and you can read on the website why that's so. And a final shameless plug, that if any of that has been of interest, uh, there are a couple of copies of this handbook for rebooting civilization along with me.